Hi there, I am Danny, spiritualtherapist.com, and welcome to this incredible, incredible episode, and it's titled, The Little Boy Abducted at 10, A Real Survivor's Story. And before we get into this beautiful man you see before you, I want to say to everybody watching that if you're somebody who isn't open to the odd F word, the odd F bomb, uh, a truth and a reality that is loved and believed by the people on screen in front of you, if you're a little bit like, you know, shut down, close minded, that's all right. We still love you, but you can leave now. Okay, bye. Sweet love, sweet love to you all. The man in front of you... <laughs> The man in front of you has got no time for that shit anyway. He has a real story to tell, guys, and it is absolutely mind-blowing for those of you that haven't seen it. And for those of you that haven't seen it, and for those of you that have, please, please share. Share this man's story wide, 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 worldwide. Tony Rodriguez, welcome, Hi. sir. Uh, hello, thanks for having me. Good to be here. My God, Tony, Hi, I'm, thank you, darling. Thank you so much for coming and playing with me today. I'm so, so, so grateful, so in awe of you and so amazed by your story. And your story starts, you know, as you often start it with you being abducted at 10 years old. But before we get into the details of the actual abduction and who abducted you and thank the heavens that you are, you know, now an adult and you, you survived to become an adult with your physical body and mind. Of course, there must be some harrowing issues along the way that you've had to deal with. But right before we get to the details of who your abductors were, um, what is your very first memory in this lifetime? You mean from, so long-term memory seems to be what I'm gifted with. I, I have terrible short-term memory to, you know, to where it's even hard when I converse with people, I'll forget what we were just talking about, but long-term memories. I remember being very young. I can remember before I could speak being a baby in the crib. I actually can see, you know, there were, there were times during, now, I don't remember all of it, but I remember bits and pieces of before I was even, even in my infancy. So I have long-term memory is a, I'm a gifted with that. I think everybody has their, their superpower. I call it, everybody has a superpower and that seems to have been mine. And it's, you know, to remember, to go through the programs that I did and have my memories erased, be blank slated, mm -hmm. uh, as, uh, most people don't remember that a lot of people have fragments. I've worked with thousands of people since coming forward. Right. And right. That's the biggest thing that surprises me is I have a great deal of memory recall. So long-term memory is something that I'm kind of a freak at. Right. So before we get into the programs and what you came forward, you know, after your abduction, um, as a little babe in the crib, what do you, what do you go there? Like, look through your eyes. Like, what are you seeing? What are you thinking? What are you sensing? I can remember a time. So this is adult. This is personal. This is bad. I can remember a time my mom used to put me and so I was born in February in Michigan. So it was winter time. So in the spring, I was only every March, April or May, just a few months old. I can remember being in the crib. My mom used to put a blanket over, you know, I was in a crib and she'd put a blanket over a blue blanket with a print, like a, it had like a, a like a penguin print on it. And they were having sex <gasps> in the room. And I thought that she, my mom was being hurt. <laughs> And I started crying. I threw a fit. I, you know, like I started crying. I was shocked oh. by it. And then, so that's one of my earlier memories, you know, that, and then there were times like when, um, the final moon mission, the last time that we went to the moon, um, I was only a few, I was only a month old or so. My dad took me out what we were watching it on the news when the moon landing, when the, when it landed ah, and it was yes. on the news, right. my dad television. picked me up and carried me outside and pointed to the moon and said, there's a man up there. And I can remember that. I can remember crawling around. There's a lot of things. There's stories with me and my, you know, my sister was five years older than me. So she, we, we talk about, and she's always been, uh, you know, just impressed that I can still remember because she can confirm it. It's not like. I'm remembering things from my childhood that, you know, can't. And she goes, yeah, that's true. I remember that too. And so uh, beautiful. Um, she's confirmed it. So it's, I, it's weird. Most people don't remember deep past things. Yeah. And the things that I am remembering are kind of not that important. Yeah. First per se, but nonetheless, I still have very long distance memory 
But I'm so happy for you, Tony, because, you know, the trauma that you suffered at 10, which we're just about to come to, it still shows and means that no matter what traumas you suffered from that moment on, is that those beings, people, whatever, didn't take that from you, that you still win, you still have that, you know, that claiming of soul, of spirit, of mind, and that is a beautiful thing, and it's something that I think is valuable and, and you know, worth, worth talking about, most definitely. I'm really happy for you because I've worked with a lot of people on different levels of abuse and trauma in this lifetime, and they have no grasp at all, nothing from that time. It's just completely wiped. Um, so bless sure. you, and I'm so happy for you. Um, all right, so we're going to come to through now. You're 10 years old, and uh, I, you were abducted at age 10. And so I'd love for you to share about the morning of the abduction. What do you remember? Do you remember getting up? Do you remember what you wore? Do you remember what you your mean bedroom looked like? You mean the morning after I woke up, what, after it was over? No, uh, the morning that you were taken. So the morning you wake up, oh, you go to school, something happened at school, you come home, you go to bed, boom. If we could go there to that morning. Remember it was a uh, colder day. It was in April. Uh, it was colder. I remember I had a brown jacket with a hood and I had boots because it had been rainy. So it was muddy and I had lived in an old farmhouse and our driveway was really bumpy and about a quarter mile long so we had it was a long 13 acres of decent sized piece of property that we mm -hmm. lived on it was an old 100 year old farmhouse and the driveway was a quarter mile long and it was bumpy and with puddles but and so i had to walk through that to get to the bus and um so i had boots on and my dad had uh, gone earlier was it that Wednesday? It was the day before? I think that my dad dropped off. No, no, no. It was later in the same day that my dad dropped off my science fair project. So it was late getting there. So when I got to school, I they sent us down because we had a science fair project, but I mine wasn't even there. So I went that they I was called to the cafeteria, but I didn't have my science fair. My dad hadn't dropped it off yet. He, he was, you know, he had to take time off work on his lunch and then run home and grab my science fair project and take it to the school. What was and, it? What was your science fair project? It was, a, it was a dam. It was like a dam where you put water in it and it would demonstrate that it had how um, they make electricity. You know, just a little wheel, simple, but it was basically, you filled it. It was a mock dam. I had a little, I used a green sponge and cut it up to make little trees and we painted it and it was incomplete. I got an eye because it was incomplete and it leaked all over the place. <laughs> it didn't work, yeah. Ah, at least you tried, darling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got an eye though for incomplete. Uh, but I went to school, so they called me down to the cafeteria and I said, I don't need, they said, I got, my teacher said, go to the cafeteria because you're in the science fair, so go. And the class had a meeting, that, that class. And I went to the cafeteria and I walked around and I knew that I was in deep crap. I remember that, that I, I knew I, because I saw some other, all, all the other kids had better stuff. And I went, oh boy, this is going to be embarrassing kind of thing. And, uh, and then I walked and I walked around the boy in question who I didn't get along with. And his dad was actually a, they were setting up his and his was on solar, solar energy, solar power. He had a can of, he had a can of Campbell's soup and he put a big, uh, uh, you know, tin foil in the shape of a of a di of a disc kind of thing, so that it would uh, cook the can of soup and warm it up to where you could eat it. Mm. And he had all, and then he had all the data on cardboard. You know how long it took in the sunlight. He he did he did science on it. Like his was awesome. I think he won it. I'm not sure, but that was his his science fair project. I walked by him and he goes, and his dad who he said was, he said, my dad's an Illuminati. What's your dad do? This is, we didn't get along. Mm. And I walked by them in the cafeteria in my muddy boots. I remember sloshing along and I hated being in my boots where my head, I had a pair of shoes up in the class, but I didn't get to change because they sent me straight to the cafeteria. This first thing in the morning, he said to his dad, that's that boy I told you about that ruined my confidence. And his dad said uh, something back. To so he doesn't look so he doesn't look so tough or something, you know, it's something like that. He doesn't look like he's much of a problem. And he said, uh, they, they talked about me and I knew they were talking about me, but I just kept walking. I didn't care. I, you know what I mean? Like I was kind of in my own world about my project wasn't done. Mm -hmm. And 
All I can remember that they had, they had, a, they said a few things that were strange. And then when I was walking with the last thing, he said, he doesn't deserve that. And his dad said, well, you're going to need to learn how to manage better than that because we'll have him, we'll have him admitted or something. He said something like that. Like, you know, we'll, we'll take him. And he goes, well, he doesn't deserve that. He said, well, you mentioned it. So you need to learn to manage your, 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 what your what you say better or something, something like vaguely like that, how the conversation went. And I didn't think any, anything of it. Later on, later on, uh, I did get an eye. So I had to set up because my, because my project was late coming. I didn't get a spot in the cafeteria. It filled up. So mine was set up in another room and I was thinking, good, people won't get to see it because it doesn't work. And, uh, they came in and judged it. I sat there. It was a, not a really um, busy day at school because of the science fair. So I went back to class for a little while, put on my shoes, tennis shoes, and then went to where my exhibit was. My dad had dropped it. I didn't even see my dad. He dropped it off and left, and then they called me out of class. And um, I sat there, then they came in. I got an I for incomplete. It was some strange, there was some strange conversation around it. Because he was there, he was the judge. Who was the judge? His dad. Mm -hmm. And then that, I'm pretty sure it was that night. So, so the passage of time is kind of hard to recall back then, you know, I'm pretty sure it was that night or the following night that I was taken. I think that was a Wednesday. And I think I was taken on a Thursday, mm. on a, you know, so mm. we set up that Wednesday, maybe the, the fair was on the following day when I got judged. So again, for those sure. that have no idea where this story, this, you know, this story of your abduction is actually heading and what kind of personal people took you, um, you're saying that this guy's little boy, friend, you know, this 10 year old kid, same age as you, uh, had accused you of taking his confidence? So yeah, there was, so we were in the talented and gifted program. Mm. We met in the library, top 5% of, of the school. And we met in the library every Wednesday for advanced learning. And basically, I mean, this is in the 80s, this is in 1982. So there's no, you know, the computers were the old pet computers that were super limited. Remember those? Yeah. Those. And um, it was just basically on how to look up information in a library, you know, it was advanced learning stuff, creativity stuff. But he was in that class too, and we did not get along. He was very smart. Like he was definitely the head of the class, very smart kid. And so I was, I guess, fueled by envy and jealousy at that point. I wanted to, I, that was my feather in my hat at home. I was the youngest of five kids. So that I had good grades. So I was smart and everybody, that's how I got a pat on the back. So I wanted to be the smart kid in that class too. And I wasn't, I wasn't as smart as him. Um, but one day I went into that, we were, I was early to the library and that kid was there. And there were three or four girls sitting around. They were in the couch in the library. And they were laughing. I walked over and I said, what's going on? And they were saying, the one girl said, he can, he can read your mind. He can, he can tell you what you're thinking. And I said, what? I said, no, you can't. And I didn't believe it for a second. And um, they said, no, do Tony, do Tony. And the girls, they were like, yeah, do him next. And he's like, no, it's your turn. And she said, no, I don't want you to don't do me. Do they do Tony. And I looked at him. And at the moment that I looked at him and I said, yeah, do me. And at the moment I looked at him, I thought to myself, you're the ugliest person I've ever met. And none of these girls will ever date you when you grow up. You're going to be, you know, that's what I was thinking. That was the cruel thought that was in my head. I thought, you're the ugliest kid I've ever seen in my life. And none of these girls think you're attractive. That's what I was thinking. And he looked at me and I could see the look in his, he went and was hurt by it. Mm. and he he was visibly hurt and then I said go ahead tell him go ahead and tell him and he said nothing and then that was it he's like no I don't want to do this anymore and that, wow. was, that was the end of it wow. and ever after that he was extremely like I had no I tried at the point because I thought you I didn't believe that he could read my mind so right. was it so you, you get what I'm saying as a I was being kid, very right very cruel but not out outwardly no because you didn't think you'd be able was, to hear it it was a challenge yes, right it was just a kid yes. thing for god's sake wow that and, was it uh, it devastated him and he hated me ever after he did everything he could to you know he didn't bully me or whatever like he didn't pick on me but he did if he could do something 
to make my life slightly harder in class, he would. Mm. You get what I mean? Like yeah. I was, he made it known, he made it known that I was from then on his enemy. Mm. And uh, so that's how that started. And me and him never really got along ever after that. Wow. So then cut to his dad, like looking down on you, his dad being part of the judging of the science fair and his father deciding some kind of fate for you, it sounds like, because he sounds like that's the guy who ruined my confidence. What a terrible thing. I mean, parents, I know, you know, parents can be very, very uh, protective of their kids and really want to get that kid back, but, a, you know, a little extreme. Okay. The, the, one, of, one of the researchers I work with said that, in fact, other people that have come forward and not publicly but people that he'd worked with that they had similar experiences that there is an echelon of people and they tend to be they tend to justify punishing people with these technology they have access to special program technology and the other people that have worked with this researcher said that they were being in fact it was a form of a punishment that they did it to punish people Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of what I went through too, but it was extremely in depth. And then the other thing is they rely on the fact that you're not going to remember. So throughout the program, after I was abducted and I was taken, whenever something bad happened to me, I said, how can you do this? You know, the answer I would always get was, you're not going to remember anyway. So don't worry about it. You're not going to remember. Mm -hmm. But that night, um, I, middle of the night, there was a a lot going on around the house. There were bright lights outside that shine down. There was a, like a static electricity buzzing noise that would buzz the house. Our phone rang. There was weird things. And then I woke up and I had a gray, basically a gray ET standing over me and it paralyzed me. And um, so you're in your I bed, taken... Tony. You're in your bed at night. You can hear all this noise outside and see lights. Are you like, what time is it? Are you in a bunk bed? Are you in a single bed? Are you in a room by yourself? I was in my room. I had a room and then across the hall, we were upstairs. There were two rooms upstairs and across the hall was my parents. My parents were in the other room. The doors were open so I could hear them. And uh, my bed had like dresser, a, a dresser under it. My bed was one piece and it had six dresser drawers under it. Mm -hmm. So it was tall. It was off the ground higher than most beds are, mm -hmm. especially for a kid. Mm -hmm. You know, it was a good three feet off the ground. Like it was a tall bed, mm -hmm. but it was just a single bed. And my room was messy. I had a bunch of toys that were piled up in the center of the room I was it was a mess I, was, I'm a, I am a messy person I, there I there I said it you know I like to keep my my house clean but my my bedroom is usually pretty messy I don't make my bed this kind of thing um but yeah and then I was taken they took me out they took me carried me short reptilians they looked so, they were reptiles so a came gray in. came you said a gray came stood over you paralyzed you so you couldn't move and then, then what happened? I believe there were three of them, <clears throat> three uh, reptilians, shorter reptilians with hoods came on, came from the foot of my bed around and grabbed me and carried me to the end of my bed. There was a bright flash of light and I lost consciousness at that point. I, went, I, got, I was knocked out by whatever happened. It knocked me out and I woke up in a, and so it's, it's worth noting, uh, so people understand that I, so I've had laser surgery on my eyes, but back then I needed glasses very, you know, most of my life, in the, even until I was 20, almost till I was 30 years old, I wore glasses. I had very bad um, eyesight, poor eyesight. And back then I did too. So I woke up and it was blurry. I was in a laboratory and it was blurry. Let's fix this here. But I was naked sitting on a metal bed, like a metal, um, a, like a stainless steel bed, you know, or like a table, table. And it was, a, the room was rounded and the front of the room, like the size of not quite a garage door, but a good size was round. And there were people and beings walking by and there was two gray ET looking there that were probably robots. They were very, uh, matter of fact, very un, in, not in, interpersonal. They could communicate with me, but it was very interpersonal, very cold communication. Is it like telepathic? Sit. Yes, all in my head. I could hear it all in my head. And there was a the rep, uh, there was a reptilian, and he was telling me he was the one that was actually. And how do I how do I say this? Um, he was like a person. Communicating with him was like talking to anybody. He was like a. Um, he had a sense of humor. 
and he was just more more of a uh, enjoyable conversation than with them. They when talking with the Grays, it was very very direct, very cold. No, sit, move. You know, like they were very very matter of fact. Mm -hmm. Then a taller, uh, long necked, white, more white colored gray looking being came in, and he was kind of directed traffic and was more of like the doctor. And they ran tests on. They poked me uh, with a few things and. I was talking to the reptiles. I, I can't believe I knew it. I was thrilled. I was. I knew aliens were real. You, you're going to come down to the earth now, right? We're going to talk to aliens. This is it. I thought it was the disclosure. I thought it was contact. Right, right. This is. I amazing. thought that tomorrow it was going to be on the news. Oh my God. So in that moment, you're conscious. You're awake. You know you're on a spaceship. You've been taken. There's these two non-communicative, non-feeling, and the human senses must have been like, "Fuck, shit." You know, you're a little boy, like your adrenals must have been crazy. So, you know, That's these little grays can't communicate. This reptilian sounds like he kind of had somewhat of a heart, but there's obviously a connection going. You're 10, you're thinking, I knew aliens were real. And then what? Where are they poking you? What are they doing to you? So they did a, uh, the one came up, they did something in my neck. They took a, like a, uh, I don't know if it was brain cells. Like they took a biopsy of brain, you know, it's from my head. Uh -huh. that they took they had to take a bio they had to do a basically what we call a biopsy they told me they took cells and they needed to analyze them if i was going to be compatible with what they wanted to do Stem so cells, they had to run a think? test i have no idea i don't know hmm. but um so they had to wait for the results of the test that's the other thing and they did a few th it was painful when they did that uh it hurt hmm. Uh, the reptilian was kind of like, you know, like he spoke in a manner like, hey, hey, buddy, you know, like, how's it going? You just relax. Everything's cool. And I would talk. I was talking to him. And I and like I said, I was excited. I said, this is contact. This is great. You know, I knew you guys were real. I knew this. I always knew it. We're ready for you. Come. You know what I mean? Like people of the earth are ready for you. I, I thought. I thought that um, it was a much different thing than what was really going to happen. But it came back, my test results came back, and uh, I was asking him, how many, how many different kinds of you are here? There's more than, you guys all work together, what's going on? And he said, yeah, there's plenty of people here like that, uh, that, are, that are from different worlds that we work together. He's like, you're really going to freak out when you see one of the insectoids. And it, then later on, he told me one just walked by, but I couldn't see it. He said, see, can you see him? And I couldn't see it. It was just too far away. Like my only had 12 inches of sight. It was blurry. Mm. So I was like, man, I was like, can you fix my eyes? Do you guys know how to fix my eyes? Can you do that real quick? You know, I even asked him that. You can fix my eyes, can't you? Can you make it where I can see? And he said, no, no, one thing at a time kind of thing. And uh, they got my biopsy back or they got the, the test results back. And uh, they said, yeah, we're going to take you. It, it'll work. And then the one said to the reptilian, make sure you get his permission. We have to get his permission. And I said, what's going on? You know, he said, well, we, we need you to help us out. We want you to come and work with us for 20 years. And I said, no, I can't do that. There's no way I have mom and dad. My, I have a family. I'm not going to be gone. They, they would miss me. I'd have to go home. He said, no, no, no. And he explained, he said, no, you're going to go back home tomorrow. We have time travel. So my dogs are out there. He said, we have time travel. And uh, my dogs. Lovely. Let them and he explained it to me that I that it was very that I was lucky. He said, "You're very lucky to be picked for this. This is like this is gonna you can live an extra twenty years." He's like, "Out of your whole life, you get to live an extra twenty, and then go back, and we put you back." He's like, "This is this is an extra this is bonus for you." And uh, I think that I honestly think that the words I used were career return. You're going on a career return. I said, am I going to learn a career? He said, no, probably not. You know, like he was joking. He was, he messed with me too. He was, you know, you know, when somebody messes with somebody and they kind of don't know it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Manipulation. Like, mm -hmm. When they joke about them to their face mm -hmm. and you can kind of feel like it, like you feel like you're the butt of the joke, but you're not in the joke. Yeah. You get what I mean? Like you're not mm -hmm. included. Yeah. He did that. He did some of that. And, uh, but I said, I said, I can't go. I said, you're sure. You're sure I'm going to be home tomorrow. My parents won't miss me. He said, they're not even going to know you were gone. They won't even know you were gone. 
And I said, okay, well, I'm, I'm, I want to help you guys out. Sure, I'll help. And then bang, they put me back on the table. So this is an area of contention. This, this, the next thing that I remember is kind of an area of contention with some people in the field of ufology at this point. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> there's the Travis Walton case. There was the movie he made. And it was basically the same procedure where they laid me back on a table and they put a sheet over me and the table sucked it tight. And I said, why are you doing this? I mean, and I said, are you going to hurt me? And they said, no, 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 we're not going to hurt you. This, this is fine. And then they put the sheet over me and it sucked it tight. And I went and it sucked it in my mouth and then they cut it. And then they pulled the around the eye and they cut that so that there was a hole over my eye and a hole that I could breathe from my mouth. And I said, you guys, you said you weren't going to hurt me, but you could have, I could have suffocated just now. And he's, how did you know that I was going to suck in? You could have cut me with the knife. What's, you know what I mean? I was questioning them. I was a 10 year old kid. So I wasn't mm. really for, you know, and he goes, we know you would have sucked in. They all do that. Mm. And the plastic is for you. It's not for us. He, he said, you have, germs on you you have microbes on you that can get you infected if we went for this procedure it's not us we don't have microbes on us that would hurt you know that so the the sheet was to protect me from me so they didn't have to clean me up mm -hmm. if that makes sense yeah to sterilize myself so they wrapped me up in a plastic sheet so what i'm saying is the contention is that the travis walton movie that depicts this scene pretty accurately Travis went, came out years later and said that he never described that, that the producers of the show in, did that scene, it was completely fiction, that that was not in his account. And they were just trying to describe the helplessness he felt. And that's how they came up. And I said, wait a minute, because somebody had asked me early on, a friend of his had asked me like, do you, is it exactly how you remember it? You said that that scene is exists like the scene in the movie. I said, yes, that's exactly what I remember going through. And I had remembered this long before I saw the movie, the damn movie. Um, so my question back was, you know, number one, you, he quit talking to me and I, that was kind of, you know, I wanted to have more back and forth, but they just kind of thought that Tony's crate, not real, you know, because he, you're getting, you're getting your thing, you're mixing it from the movie. But my question is, is how did the, how did the movie producers come up with that? Mm -hmm. With knowing that procedure, the way that they did. And, and in fact, I, you know, I'm going to do a show about it in, on my own show coming up that, um, a lot of movies seem to have a lot of accurate. It's not, it's not the, it's not in the writing. It's not in the directing. It's not in the acting. It's in the special effects. Mm -hmm. So the special effects companies that are do, filling in the, filling in the background scenes and the, the building these computer generated sets mm -hmm. are putting accurate things that are really mm -hmm. up there. Accurate secret space program things from colonies that are up there, like accurate info. That are, have nothing to do with the movie they just you know it's the backdrop mm -hmm. and these people are kind of in the know it's obvious and i'm gonna get it i'm gonna get a uh, you know like a collection of movies because i just saw i just saw one this morning i was looking for a movie to watch earlier this morning very early i got up at like four in the morning so i was sitting there bored and i was looking and i started seeing things in the and i went how do they even know that that's exactly it's not exactly what it's like. it's like. That shape is exactly what I remember. This is exactly what I remember. Right. And it's right. movies that are, I've never seen before. Mm -hmm. So it's not like I got the information from the yeah. movie because it's brand new. So yeah. it's, it's like happening whole, over and over again. Exactly. You know, people look at Gene Rodenberry, who, as we know, brought us Star Trek. And there are lots of people in the spiritual community and metaphysical community who basically say he was what we know as a bleed through or a drip through. So he was given information just dripping through into his conscious mind. He would then create, you know, same with Carl Sagan, people like that, you know, um, in my own world and my own experiences that I've had on and off wherever, um, I'm, you know, the same thing. These things happen. You meet people, they talk about things and, you know, that's happened. I've seen that. Or say, if I'm reading someone, I see something they, that's happened. I'm like, yeah, that's happened to me too. I know that. Like, you know that. Like you say, you get that recognition, whether you, whether, whether it's on a cellular responsive, uh, you know, mechanism, because our cells carry every single memory of anything that's ever happened to us and they get triggered at that moment. It isn't just about sight or sound, is it? Sometimes it's just more of that kind of sentience. But that is absolutely incredible. Honestly, my heart is thumping because I've never heard 
heard some of the details that you're giving, then it's so exciting, but obviously tragic too, but it's so beautiful. Thank you for padding out more of like, you know, what, what you went through. So here you are with this reptilian who's clearly manipulating a 10 year old little boy to falsely get your consent. Yes, right. Uh, the other thing is uh, in the movies, there's a lot of deniability. I, that's my number one thing, like on YouTubes that get posted about my story. People go, oh, he, that, he just got that from Starship Troopers. <gasps> oh, he oh, saw the movie me. Communion. You know, they, they put these things in move. They put things in movies. Now they're in overdrive because the disclose, the people that like myself that are whistleblowers that have come out in disclosure, they're really trying to keep up with the movies, with the things we're describing so that they can, they can say, well, he just saw that in a movie. Okay, but yeah. haven't you noticed that like, let's, let's take you, Tony Rodriguez, abductee contactee, Alex Collier, also a friend of mine, um, abductee contactee, Elena Danan, beautiful Elena Danan, also a friend. Okay, so if you take you three, for example, you're out and Alex has been out on the platform now for over 30 years, 30 years, and talking about the Andromedans and his connection. So all of a sudden, there are literally hundreds of thousands more people coming into a new awareness in the last two years in particular. And they're all friggin' experts. They're all like, no, that was the electrical wars. No, that was when Andromeda and the Orions clashed. They don't know shit. They're actually learning in real time from you, Elena, and Alex, you know, in general. Of course, there are others. Of course, there are. But, you know, I think it's a little bit, you know, good advice for some of those people who now think they're experts um, just to listen a bit more and have a bit more respect for these humans who've actually lived the horror of being abducted by off-planet species. There's a little bit. So I can, I'm not going to speak to Elena. I love Elena Denon. We, we, Fortunately, I've befriended her and we speak from time to time. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not uh, friends with Alex, though I've sat in on some of his info, but I, I don't really study the, the genre. I learned not to in the beginning, because if I do repeat any of it, I quickly get, you could get in trouble and say you stole that from somebody else. So I turned it all off so that I could preserve my own information mm. so that I wouldn't cloud up the water with other people's testimonies. So I really don't study anybody else's thing. But there is a very real phenomenon where people get memories. I'm not saying they weren't abducted. I'm not saying they didn't do a 20 back or go into a soldier program or whatever. There's a very real phenomenon where people are connecting the dots too quickly with their own memory recall. And it gets filled in. And there are, I did a show on this earlier today. There's a, there's a many ways that people get led on. They get re hypnotic regression uh, sessions and they get led led into answers and then once that happens that it's like programmed on a subconscious level and then those are the memories yeah so we're seeing a lot of people like you said that are overnight experts that still have some unpacking to do um fortunately for me i was researched in the beginning and i didn't have a lot of contact with other things i had some secret space program information and I was into the sub, you know, I was studying it. I was looking for answers back then, but then I was researched and there were some things that kind of backed up my story that I was genuine, that backed up the genuineness mm -hmm. of my, of my account. Mm -hmm. And so I was very fortunate because nowadays you really can't introduce much that new to it. Everybody's kind of told everything that's been going on right. up there. It's hard to, it's hard to have new information in this right. to, that would, it's hard to say something that would prove your case that somebody else hasn't already said mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. now. So it's people are desperate for that. I know that feeling. And I made some mistakes early on with researchers because I was just desperate for them to listen to me. And uh, people, we see that right now. So, and like you said, people are experts about it. There's a lot. The very first thing I recognize is that I went through some great, um, I went through a brain blender and I went through mind versions of mind control they did attempt to put screen memories in there. They did it. They attempted a lot of things. And so I always tell people to take my information with a grain of salt because I may believe it wholeheartedly. And there may be things that are not super accurate. Right. However, I've been able to prove a lot of the accuracy. So um, with that, with the one, with the memories that I have been able to prove, I have to trust the ones, the other ones that I mm. can't prove wow. directly. But wow. Anyhow. Amazing. Oh my God. 
So let's go back to 10. You're still 10 years old. You've mm. just now agreed with this horrible repti reptilian manipulator um, to do what, what is now become known in the public domain, 20 and back, which most yeah. of us, again, we've never heard of. We've never heard of this. And this a comes under the return. banner. Right, a career return. It comes under the banner of the secret space program, which, again, most people in this last two years are just coming to understand and realize about this so can you tell us what happened after you've made the agreement with the reptilian coerced into it you know manipulated and then what happened next quite a bit well i lived well in a nutshell i'll say it quick for people that don't know is that i was taken and then i lived in black programs and then eventually sold to the secret space program and lived off world for 20 years it was a 20 year period that i was basically you know a uh a slave for them, for these programs, for black programs. And then age regress. So there's great info. William Tompkins came forward and has great information explaining how they do that and what the parameters of that, of age regression, however they do it. Um, I, I have my own theories on what I went through, but then put back like the next, very next day. So that's the real, that's the real phenomenon, the technology. And you really lose people when you talk about the time travel aspect of, they right. go, wait a minute. Where were your parents while you were gone? I get that question a lot. I'm like, my parents never knew I was gone. I woke up the next morning after it was over. But anyhow. This is so back they... to the future. You know, if anybody is struggling to find something to relate in this moment, then for me, it's like back to the future. The, Marty wakes you know, the, up. That the, When he woke up that next morning and his life was different, was the exact same. That's another, this is another movie that I looked at and I went, what? It's programming because... When, when he woke, remember he woke up and he, th he was like, he thought it was all a dream and he was back in his life. And it wasn't until he saw the differences, like all his life was better. All of a sudden he had his new yeah. truck and everything. Yes. But that feeling of bewilderment that he had is exactly what I had the next morning. I woke up and I went, this is my room. I looked over at my pile of toys and I went, toy and I didn't need my toys anymore. I never really played with them ever after that. All my toys and my Hot Wheels and I, I quit playing with them mm. that day because it was 20 years later for me. But I woke up, it was the same bewildered feeling the next morning. How did so, your parents react? Like, what did you do? Did you hug them like you hadn't seen them for 20 years? Like, what I did. did. Oh. I did. My sister said I was being stupid. She's like, we just had dinner. I said, I feel like I haven't seen you guys in years. And my sister said, shut up, stupid. We just had dinner last night, you know? And we sat down and had breakfast. But um, they had their own stuff. Uh, Going back to the procedure, when I was, when he put me under the sheet and did that, they stuck, a, there was a big robotic arm that was a gold colored needle that went in my tear duct of my mm. dominant eye, my right eye here. It went right in there. And it was like, I saw stars, like being punched and you see stars. I had that feeling and it felt like I got sucked out of my body. And I, when I woke up, I had no memory of who I was, mom or dad or, um, I had no idea. I couldn't even talk. It took me a few days to remember how to speak. I didn't have a grasp of language. And I woke up in a portable, like a a portable in uh, Inyokurt with a doctor and a nurse checking me out. And he was asking me questions. Do you remember how you got here? Do you remember your mom or dad? And I was like, no. And uh, he said, that's because you're a clone. That's what the doctor was told that I was. And uh I began a program. So that, I mean, I was there. I, at first I thought that I was in, um, uh, in Yokern only for like six months or a few months. What is Yokern, Tony? In Yokern is a airport that's in Southern California, right next to China Lake, the town over town, just West of China Lake, California, mm -hmm. Southern California. It's called in Yokern. And that was, there were portables at the time. There were buildings there. I believe they've been demolished since then. And they have like a carport building or like another small building in the same spot. But uh, the three buildings there were set up for this program that we were in. It was an offshoot I found out of Project Real Flame. And uh, we were, there was a dozen kids or so, all about my age. And we were, in, they, they had old uh, X surplus like hospital beds. And uh, we began like a mind control, uh, trauma-based mind control program. Did you know these kids? Did you send them before? Were there any other kids from your no. school? That pissed I had complete oil? amnesia. I had, there were. Oh, so, okay, let me, let me slow this down. 
I had at the time I had complete amnesia. I had no idea who I was, where I came from. I had no recollection of anything that happened before the day that when I woke up, I felt terrible and needed more sleep and was I hungry, thirsty, all of it. And I went through a medical examination and I could barely speak. I had no memory of anything. Later on, I mean, obviously I've had a lot of time to think about it. There were kids from my school that were in there with me, I believe. So, um, and then it was movies. They plugged, they drugged us. We had chairs, we had helmets that had electrodes in them that would shock us while we were watching movies that were a blend between cartoons, Disney cartoons and uh, gore. They would, it would flash to a movie. You'd see animals being butchered. You would see car people, dis car accidents. And then it would go back to a, the Wizard of Oz kind of thing or um, what was the uh, Snow White, the Snow White movie from Disney, it was that. And then they had, it was flashing. Would you get uh, shocked? At, message. Sorry to interrupt, but would you get shocked at a moment of something so horrific to remove any sensitive sens sensitivity towards something that you're looking at? What was the? It stayed on the whole time. Like we were getting shocked. It would shock. It would. It would. It would shock, and then it would change. There were four. There were four electrodes in the helmet. There was. A, it was like an old motorcycle, a '70s motorcycle helmet, mm -hmm. and it had electrodes in it. And the electrode, which you could feel it, that it would shock you here, like there, and go through you. And then it would change and shock to this electrode while the movie, and it stayed on. It stayed, it never, never, you know, it would shock you and then stop and then shock you. It, it was not synced to the movie, no. Right. That was my question, um, yeah. But at the end of the day, he would take us all in and brief us. He would ask us, how do you feel? Who's he? How do you feel today? The doctor. Mm -hmm. Um. It was one guy in charge of the whole thing. Thick Coke bottle glasses, curly hair. I won't give any identities away, but he was a tall, he was very tall. He had thick glasses. Was he very human? curly hair. Yeah, oh yeah. This was in California. This right. was all there were no ETs or nothing. Right. When I went to after that, I woke up and I was in a human-based program. You I was were on a CIA a... funded program in Southern California in 1982. People are like, well, it was in another dimension. It wasn't. It wasn't. I woke up the next day in California in 1982. So this means that when they put me back, also the next day, there were two of me and I could have met myself. If Tony from Michigan would have went to Southern California, I could have theoretically met my, uh, my doppel, a twin. Yeah, doppel So that's, twin, yeah. that's, people are always lost in the time travel aspect of it or what's going on. Mm. And that's these, that might, that's my best guess mm. at what happened, but it was it was 1982. There was no difference. I wasn't a, I wasn't on another planet. I wasn't in. This was California, and these were these were government people that were working. They were funded through Grill Flame. I found documents about it. Grill Flame. I found, look, I found like, quite a bit of information about it. Wow, and that's did the you... project name. Right, the project name, Project Royal Flame. So when you came back into awareness at the kind of stage and age you are now in this timeline, when you um, went back, did you know the project was called Girl Flame while you were going through it as a little boy? Or was it something that- it When he ahead? told us, he said that. So he, the doctor was actually a very likable asshole. It, you know what I mean? Like he yeah. was a very likable person. I don't know if it was Stockholm Center. You know, kids, mm -hmm. kids are going to trust even kids that are badly abused don't believe they're being abused. They just mm -hmm. think that everybody gets abused. Yeah. So kids are going to trust the adult, the, the authority figure. And that's how it was. But he was likable and he was very matter of fact. He explained his career, how he how he ended up there. He explained what we were doing. And when he said we were in Project Grill Flame, a lot of the kids started crying, thought we were going to be grilled. Oh. Like, like they thought we were going to be great. He said, no, no, stop. I'm that. He's like, that's just a secret name that they give for the funding. He's like, it's not. See, this is an offshoot of that. You guys aren't actually in that project. This is an offshoot made with the funding. He explained mm. it all to us as he did it. Wow. And even while he was hurting, he tortured us. And even while he was doing that, he was like, this is part of the science. There's a science for it. I've also tracked back. Um, there's a paper trail through the research institute that was behind, that was the, did the heavy lifting of the research. And I found personnel that were from 
They did have people that were specialized in the MK Ultra programming with their own flair of adding sleep deprivation to it. And I, so I found this after the fact, after 2015, when I had already documented that once they started the sleep deprivation, I kind of lost all track of time. I really, they were, they, in the beginning, we were getting the movies and then they were, they would test us. It was like movies and drugs all day long, eight hours, 10 hours a day. Boom. Then you would get debriefed and then wake up and do it again the next day. And it was like hallucinogenic drugs. But after a while, he, they hurt us. They'd wake us up in the middle of the night and, and take us out on the runway. Well, right, there was a runway, but right in like a park, it was airplane hangar so they could fly, the airplane could drive out to the runway. But they'd take us out there, it was hot at night and make us get in ice, uh, like cow troughs of, of water, of ice water and get in there until we shivered. You had to stay until you started shivering and then we could go back to bed. I don't know why they did that, but it was like on a different routine. He, he had a contraption that he hooked up to dislocate our arm, to break, either break your arm or dislocate it, and then made us watch the movies, go through our normal movie watching day. And then at the end of the day, asked us what was different, how did it feel? Like he literally was like writing down, this was, he was doing, he had a scientific approach at this, torturing us. And, um, but it got to the point when they began, there was a there was a phase that they went into and they, they started with sleep deprivation. And every 15 minutes, there was a loud bell that would go off, you know, a t like a buzzer. Mm. And we would wake up and after they would come and make us stand up at the end of our bed. Lights would come on everything. We'd stand there and they would come by. And the first time they did it, they would smack us in the face, bam. And then you were, after that, you could go back to sleep. 15 minutes later, they'd do it again. They would line us all up. Then after a few days of that, they came, I remember, and they came with like a cattle prod and they shocked us, zip. And, you know, you'd get shocked and then you could go back to sleep. And it was like, you could only sleep for 15 minutes and they did it again. And these were soldiers that came in and did it. And uh, once that started, once they did the, the sleep deprivation that uh, I lost all track of time. I had no idea what day it was or, you know, like the sleep deprivation is, was um, the by far the worst part of it that you couldn't sleep and so i don't know if it was a month of that i don't know if it's four months of it i have no idea i really don't because all i wanted was to sleep after that time and then the, during the day he was giving us drugs that would keep you awake and uh watch back to the movies again so that it just repeated over and over again the end result was that when we got shocked Forever after, for the next 20 years, and even into my life now, though it's not the same, but if we got electrical, er, shocked electrically, like somebody shocked you with a taser or something, I would just go into a complete catatonic state. Like no matter what, like if I was hysterical, if I was hysterical and I was, you know, in my 20s, during the 20 and back, during the 20 in the program, if something was bad, I was hysterical or was some, they could shock me and I would just literally stop what I'm doing and turn into a robot and await command. And no matter what, it, no matter what they told me to do, I would do it. No matter what I would, I, I, that was what that, that was what that programming achieved yeah. was that they could shock you and you would still, you would cease whatever you're doing, go into a catatonic state and you would await for the next command. And what you were told to stand on one foot, you'd stand on one foot. They, it was like the, it was like for the next hour, I was extremely agreeable. Like, that's that was and then it would wear off i would step out of it eventually wow you know and then go on about my day oh my god tony this is just so tragic and hard to hear and this, my heart is just oh my god you and all those poor children and i know it's happened so many countless times and i'm just so grateful that you know you've come back with still such a loving being and such a good guy and such a kind person and just full of you know, when you talk, we can hear the tones in your voice. We can see the love in you. We can, you know, just so grateful that you came back, you know, to, to share this such harrowing, terrible, traumatic experience that you had. It was a long time ago. I mean, I still have, I still have issues, but mm. I, I dealt with it over the time, over time. I didn't know before, before I got my memories back, I was dealing with it. I had anger issues. I had relationship issues. I had big problems. I was a mess through my twenties, 
my teens and my twenties, I was really a mess of a person and, and uh, I couldn't blame everything on my life. I didn't know why. So I kind of got, got better over time. And luckily it was a long time ago. So mm -hmm. I've had, I've had that, you know, and then when I got my memories back, I could actually start pointing fingers at why I felt the way I did about things. It was easy yeah. to fit. It was easy to, yeah. easier to deal with. Yeah. So find the memory, find the trauma, match the, the story, the feeling, the frequency, and then that's the, the healing of the, the neural pathways. Oh my goodness. So you're on earth, you're going through this horrific Mengele type Nazi experimental um, situation with all these other children. Um, and then how long you were in that program until you got moved to another? And then when did you actually go off planet? It was quite some time before I went off planet. Well, the, so I often overlook this. At the end of that, I mean, I don't know how much time you want to spend on it. I can, I can jump forward. I could give the details of what happened, but I think that's at the just end of the programming, yeah, I, I would spare, I would spare you from being feeling more empathy. I, I don't like, I don't like doing that. You know, the book is going to yeah. really hurt people. My decision to was, feel for you if I want to. Don't take that on. That's up to me. Yeah. I really went into detail with the book. It was very difficult to write. Once you put it in words on paper, it was like reliving it. So, yeah. but there's a lot of details. My book is finished. It'll come out hopefully in the next six months. At the end of that, they determined, they tested us. We went through some tests and uh, they determined theta was the, you know, um, cer certain kids weren't all going to make it into certain, for certain tasks. We went into a, uh, like a remote viewing program in the same portables and everything like it geared up. And what they had, what they were doing was administering an IV of drugs and then some drug that would put us near death. And in that time of near death, it was our higher self or whatever we were channeling. They could ask us questions and they would get answers from the past and the future and help. they could remote view very accurately through us. And I've also found the same research institute bits and pieces where they said, you know, in public, after I researched it, where doctors said we've had promising results with children and near death experiences for remote viewing. But that's exactly what they were doing. They would give me a, give us a drug. So then I went from there to whoever owned me in uh, Seattle. But during that time, they there was a ship that took us out. They took us out on the runway. It was classified. It was in the middle of the night, and a triangle came down and took us and probably a hundred people. They wheeled one of those um, staircases that are on wheels, like at the airport, like the old style when you get off on the yeah. on the tarmac. They wheeled one of those up to it. We got on this ship and we went to the moon. We went to the base on the moon and all the kids that myself and the kids from that program were led in and we had a few surgical procedures done on us. And we went back the same night. They then, as soon as we were done, they put us right back on the ship and we went right back to Inyo Kern that night. All right. So, so there, was a, there was an enhancement that they did to us. Oh my God. So you get wheeled out and you get, you go on this triangular shaped ship. What color was it on the outside? Do you remember? Is it black? It had, well, it was dark, but it was gray. I want to say it was, it was, it a, was gray a gray shape. color. Triangular. Yeah. Okay. And so you get on it. What was it black like getting on dark. board? We got on, it was just like an airplane on the inside. But like an airplane. Okay. It was, How but it was, the rows were much wider instead of nine or 12 seats. It was like 20 or 30 seats wide, the row. Were there any beings and that you saw who were driving it? No, it was, this was a military, military. Oh, Right. Okay, got it. This the was military. The Air Force. Okay, the yep. UAPs, the unidentified aerial phenomena, or whatever. They're trying to mislead us now, of course. The, well, they tried. Oh to... yeah, it was the it was a it was a yeah. military so how, ship. How quickly from the ground to the moon did this vehicle get you there? It was a couple hours, I think. Uh -huh. Did you it feel like you were few... going really fast, or? No, you couldn't tell how fast. It was just like riding on a plane. It was quiet. Um, they did a little, when we got to the moon, they, the wall, the wall got clear or like, or, or the entire wall was a TV screen, whatever, but it turned in, you could see outside and the pilot came over and was explaining where we were and that we were passing the original, the first base, you know, that there was a base 
and you could see the moon, you know, he, and he told the stats on how far we had just went 200,000 miles, you know, like he, he was giving us just like a, just like an airplane ride. Right. And we went into a base, you know, I don't remember a ton of it because that also at the time, I just wanted to go to sleep. Mm. You know, I think I did not off. I, um, you know, I did go to sleep on the, during the ride, but it was when we got, when we got close to the moon that I woke up and was listening to it. Um, but then we came back and I was sold. I was taken, they, they put us on a green school bus, you know, like a, the old school bus, but it was green, yeah, dark green colored. And they drove us over to China Lake to the town of China Lake. And I remember that because there were airplanes on pedestals at some of the intersections. They had old World War II planes right. or like a jet plane, like a Vietnam era plane. Yeah. And the kids were, we were like on that side of the bus could see it, you know, and I, I remember that they were saying, we went to an Air Force building and it was like an administrative, like an office building. We went in the elevator and we went down and he had to turn it. We went down to the bottom and then one of the guy that was with us put a key in the elevator and turned it and it kept going down. Like it was, you know, like it accessed to go secretly yeah. down, deeper down. down. And down. when we got out, there was a train station. It was a train station. And we rode a train to, we stopped in Los Angeles. And then I went on to Montana, a place near Helena, Montana, and in only like an hour, so yeah. an hour, cool. hour, and it was super fast. Right. So for a moment, can we just look at that? The magnetic levitation trains, the maglevs, as they're called. Do you feel like you were on an underground maglev that can go from one end of the earth to the other in just a matter of minutes or hours, depending on, again, it it's old fast. technology. Yeah. I went back and did the math on it. I looked at it and just as a crow fly. It was very, it was very fast. It was over 900 miles an hour, I think. Before, uh, no, I. It's been years. Like in in the when I first got my memories back, it's been like 2015 since I went back on the map, and I just kind of did the quick sketch. But I remember that it was uh, about an hour ride. So and plus we stopped in Los Angeles. Like we went from Inyo Kern to Los Angeles, and then to Montana. So it was pretty 500 miles or something like that. Mm -hmm in 45 minutes to an hour so it was pretty quick wow um but when i was left out when i got out they brought me out and in, into a like a field you know it was like in the wilderness and a car lady was there in a car and she grabbed me and drove me back to seattle and she, that, they were my owners they owned me he was a billionaire i was actually a piece of equipment that he owned after i got out of it so they owned they were my owners and they were satanists and <sighs> they practiced they did a satanist ritual that i was in and then they put us under so he was getting business advice you know he they put us under he had there were three of us it was myself and a girl and another boy and they put us on they did a ritual thing and then they gave us ivs and they put us so they were getting asking questions for his self for his for business i mean you think about how how uncanny how lucky some billionaires are to make such right correct decisions right and now you think they have access to that kind of technology then i went from there to peru i'm trying to get forward because you asked me about when i went into space finally I, from there i uh, was only there like a week week or two and then they his he had a private like a propeller plane coming i land on his property and it flew me to dallas we stayed the night and then i flew to peru porto to Wanton, suyo peru and um i was there a couple years and what they did was they were flying shipments of cocaine from from that town in Peru to Santa Marta, Colombia. And during that flight, they would put me under and I would be like a security, like a navigation slash, you know, canary in the coal mine to let them know if the police were waiting or if something bad was going to happen. I was in a state of mind where they could ask me questions. So you were remote and viewing out the body. I was remote viewing, viewing yeah. for the plane, for the plane as a security precaution. You wonder how the war on drugs why they can't catch stop the drugs from coming in that's because they have that kind of technology they're using um and i did that like monthly for a couple of years uh, and right when i was around 12 or 13 i lost i must have been about 13 so i lost the ability i started not being able to do it and then they shipped me back to seattle and i lived there for a couple of years and then was sold off into the space program and oh, went into space and really never never came back the boy and the girl oh, I, mean, that, I did come back 
Well, the boy and the girl that were with you and sold to the satanic family, um, did you ever see them again? Do you know what happened to them? No. No. They went to their own, they went to other um satanic families. You know, well, stations. No, the other I don't know where they went. Mm. I, I really don't know. They he said that he was gonna find us our um the place where we would fit. How did he put it? I'll find everybody the place where they most ideally fit and it'll run like a symphony. I like all my employees to run like a symphony. And we're going to find where you where you play the best. And I think because of my black hair and you know I'm Portuguese, that's why I ended up in Peru and right. they put them somewhere else. The other boy was a he had he had dark brown hair, but he was like a white kid. And the girl was had blonde hair. She had straight blonde hair. So I don't know where they went. I really I don't know. Mm. Wow, gosh. All right, so from Peru to? Back to Seattle for a couple of years. And basically, like a, they, I just lived there with other boys. It was like a foster home, and they were using us as sex slaves. It's hard to admit that, but it's true. We were being raped and um, sold off to parties. He had political parties there. He had other rituals that happened. And uh, I did two summers of that, and it was basically... <sighs> I guess there was another house on the property that had girls, but we were, they kept us away from girls. Mm. So it's an, it's a really difficult subject to go into, but again, as the world is coming to a self realization that a lot of the top prominent roles in the society are run by really fucking sick pedophiles and people are like, Oh no, they're so good because we're so programmed to feel and think that way. But the most horrific, horrendous things we can't even imagine half the things are in your face, are happening, are real. And I always go back to one example in Britain, this guy called Jimmy Savile. And Jimmy Savile was this guy, we grew up with Saturday night, mum, dad, brothers and me. Who's Jim going to fix it for? This white man, you know, white man, wow. white hair, cigar, sitting in a seat. And you'd write to him and say, Jimmy, fix it for me. I want to be a nursery nurse. Can I go to the hospital for the day and look after the newborn babies? Yes, Danny, I'll fix it for you. So you'd get taken to London and Jim was there and Jim fixed it and then at the end you'd watch the little movie that was made of your day and he'd sit you down and he'd put a medal on you you'd get the award and it said Jim fixed it for me the entire wow. great British Isles that's England Scotland Ireland and Wales we were absolutely obsessed with this man we thought he was the hero but we are so programmed adults children this is a good person so we're skewed this is a good person even if you think he's a bit weird looking he feels a bit dodgy, but hey, it's Jimmy Savile, you know, he's going to fix it. He turned out to be one of the sickest, and I'm not going to go into details, sickest pedophiles that he would rape and molest old people, disabled people, children with cancer in hospital, didn't matter if you were alive or dead. If he wanted you, he was going to take you. Wow. So whenever people wow. are like, oh, no, no, I'm like, I'm sorry, here's an example of someone that we have got to uh, grow something within us to be able to see people like you Tony and really listen and think to ourselves no I'm not going to condemn that man who's been through hell that we can't even imagine as some kind of nut job lunatic no this man is telling the truth and as difficult as it is for us to accept many of us not me but many people that have never even considered such horrors it's time I like to point out that that time so in the beginning in two i got my memories back in 2015 basically it all made sense i always had some memories throughout my life didn't make sense but i got the big breakthrough in uh, april may end of april uh, early may of 2015 i got all the, the memories came back I, I remembered everything and i started working with researchers so back then there was no pedo pizza gate there was no connection the people were talking about the secret space program they were not talking about slavery and they were definitely not talking about a satanic elite that had access to it. And I was the first one that said that back in 2015, I went on record with researchers and wow. it's panned out. That's, it's one of those things that panned out. The other thing is that I got a few things wrong in the beginning because memories were still coalescing. It's, it's a difficult process to live through. And in the beginning, I was, I was desperate for a researcher to um, believe me. You know, so I wanted to give them, I was trying to give them something that would keep them working with me. And uh, so I got something wrong. He said, no, you, you're wrong here. I checked it out. It's, it's wrong. 
So then another researcher who was an, uh, a former Satanist, Church of Satan person who knew how that went, started asking me questions and asked me about the ritual. And I explained everything that I remembered and it was actually right. She said, That's exactly how that works. How would you know? There's no way you would know because not even a beginner Satanist would, would know these things. These are things that are like high up in their church. And um, so they got contact with the other researcher and let them know that, you know, I had some factual thing that I deserved to be researched more and other things have panned out. But what I'm saying is that period in time really was my evidence. Mm. It really was my best evidence too to move forward, to be able to speak about it. Mm. And because if I didn't have any evidence, I wouldn't speak. I wouldn't be putting it going on. Okay, I wouldn't do that to my, to my family. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Wow. But uh, I eventually was no good for that service. And, uh, you know, I don't want to get into a ton of detail about it, but then I was sold off. And then I went to the moon and went through a training program, um, which really wasn't training. It was more like it was mind control just to train you to not fight or pull, to train you to not run mm -hmm. when in a uh, life and death situation to actually uh, like suicide like suicide bomber that mm. and we were being trained to be support soldiers for uh mars colony corp and i was flown to mars and was there for i was on mars actually a very short time probably six months to a, less than less than a year and the program i was in we did we did operational uh missions out on the surface of mars and there are insectoids that are indigenous there that they were worried about that they couldn't match the numbers with the soldiers that they had so they were trying to make a cheap, easy soldier, and that's what we were. God. And um, were the insectoids, we did operational missions. Sorry, were the insectoids, were they standing up? Were they upright? Or were they the little ones that fly? Like I've seen the ones that look like giant wasps. I saw those at, um, flying in the sky at Camp Pendleton, and I was driving through one day, and I was thinking, why the hell aren't people throwing their car off the side of the road? Surely they can see all the green lights. Surely, surely to God. Anyway, so I threw a thought out, which is, you know, unfortunately something I've learned to stop doing, but threw a thought out, like, I can see you, and they, some got together, and the next thing, it's right beside the car, right beside the car, my car, my window was open this much, and it was like this giant, soft-bodied, almost caterpillar-like, organic being, and its legs kind of hung, and it was making a really low humming noise, I was like, oh, shit, shit, I was like, sorry, 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 please leave, please leave, and then it just went back. And I shit myself. So did you see those kinds of insectoids? Um, soft bodied, no, but they were different. There were beetles and mantids that were different sized, but they were, and uh, like a spider, a bigger one that was more like a spider that engaged us. And they had, they all had pinchers that came and, and actually some of their pinchers would cross like that. But the beetles, they flew and they, they when they were on the Mars and the in the gravity, it's like they would fly for 50 yards and then touch down and jump and keep flying. Like they had a hop to them. Uh, but no, I didn't see those, but there are many different kinds. There's, it wasn't all just one kind. Yeah, of that, course. Did you breathe the air in? I know there's an atmosphere on Mars. I, I, believe, I believe that they had modified us surgically so that we could breathe there better. I believe that there was a treatment they did to us. But yeah, we, we were breathing the atmosphere. Yeah. And our suit, so I had a cone, it came out, it was open faced, we had a cone and it would, when we exerted ourselves, it would give us oxygen, the suit would supplement. So it didn't have to carry a ton of oxygen. It was, a, you know, it was less to it. It was an environmental suit and it kept us warm. It was super comfortable. Uh, it was super comfortable. The boots were awesome. Wow. So inside the base on the moon, what on the, on Mars, what did the other people, were there lots of humans, were there hybrids, were there other alien types? just people. This was a military base. These were right. soldiers and these were soldiers, scientists and command crew. That was it. And it was a base that was made to house like 200 people. And there were only like 50 people there because it had been overrun in the past. Like, I guess they had some they had casualties there. So it had been evacuated. And then we were there. We were doing an experimental program. You know, they were trying to, and what happened was the, the insects adapted to the tactics that we used much quicker than they were supposed to. So they canceled the program, they canceled mm. it. Wow, they couldn't outsmart the indigenous beings on Mars. Is that what you're saying? 
Yeah. Well, yeah, they were, they were intelligent. Mm -hmm. They were, they were intelligent, not, not in a way that we think are, but still very intelligent mm -hmm. beings. Mm -hmm. um, then I went to a bigger city, like an underground city. They flew us to another city. And then I went in and I had, that was actually um, not a bad time. I had my own little, it was almost like a, like an apartment. Well, at least I had, I had a bedroom and a bathroom. It was like a hotel room. So most of the time when I stayed somewhere, it wasn't that luxurious. I had a bed and then I had a bathroom. I had water. I had running water and everything. It was comfortable. And then I went to school. They did aptitude testing. And this was another one of those same tall white grades mm. that was kind of the professor. And then they plugged us in and I took, it was testing. You would just look at the screen and they'd show you a movie and then boxes would come up with possible answers. And all you had to do was stare at the box and it would highlight, is this your answer? And just kept looking at it. Mm. And then that, that was the testing. It was fast. And I uh, qualified for uh, uh, maintenance, ship maintenance. Uh, and that's what I learned. I took, I took um, training videos and they were all about fire suppression and safety and how to use a few tools. But um, that was it. That was all the training I needed. And when you say I ship, was, you mean spaceship, spacecraft, spaceship, aerial craft? Spaceship yeah. maintenance. Yep. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. then I was taken to another train station and the train went, this one, you could clearly feel it lift off of the tracks. Mm -hmm. The other one, you never felt it lift up. This one, you clearly felt it because it, it, your chair, everything, the whole thing just lifted up and it went into a tunnel and there was a bright flash of light, like a poof. And then it immediately started slowing down and I was not on Mars anymore. When it landed, when it opened uh, just a few minutes later, it stopped. I was on Ceres colony. Ceres. And it was a complete Ceres. Yes. Yeah. C-E-R-E-S. -E 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 yeah. Ceres colony. And mm. it was ran by the Deutsch. So that's how they identified themselves. So they don't, they, they were Germans. They were, they were breakaway from Nazi Germany, but they considered themselves the Deutsch, not, mm. not German. They didn't say we're Germans, you know, like mm. I, we did, we called them Germans mm -hmm. when we spoke between ourselves, but they mm. considered themselves the Deutsch culture. Mm. So, which is not only Germany, I guess they were, and they were very, um, they were very proud of their history uh, of the 30 years war, that that was a major, that was actually on their money scenes from the 30 years war. And that was a lot of their history there um, that they were identified with as the Deutsch people from the 30 years war that were victorious. They say that the 30 years war, they said that the 30 years war was the first time that humans from earth defeated an ET influence. So that ETs came and influenced our society all the time. Right. And they stood up for they stood up and defeated them because they won the 30 year war and actually splintered off from Catholicism into uh, Protestant. You could be a Protestant and Catholicism. And I think the, a few other religions sprouted up at that time. They won religious independence from the Vatican. And so but their version of history on Ceres colony were that that was an ET influence that was controlling Europe at the time. And they stood up and, and won. Mm. And so, and their motto is that we did it with horses. They, they, that was a motto of the someplace they we did it, we did it on horses. That was incredible. And they had spaceship, they had spaceships, we had horses and we won. That was her, that was kind of their, it was a motto. That's fascinating. Do you think that they named themselves the Deutsch to make a definite separation from the original Nazis from World War II that we came to understand, then came to the States and other places, Argentina. But if we look at the States, Antarctica as well, that the Nazis were there. We've got Project um, Paperclip, where they were selected to come to the States, Project High Jump, which is where uh, Captain Bird came and you know they did a land, sea, air attack. And then all of a sudden, up come the Nazis at their anti-gravity machinery that the Americans thought, shit, they've got a bit too much power there. We better go and check out what's going on. And then for the, just for those that don't know, just a quick run through. Um, and so my question is, are these Deutsch now separating themselves from that Nazi Germanic um, takeover from Antarctica or are these the same people? They, had, they are the same people, but the it, it's kind of like to call them Nazis is to call them the, like Democrats or Republicans kind right. of thing. That was mm -hmm. a political party. That's why um, 
a lot of it was similar. A lot of their a lot of their policies were similar to Nazi Germany, but they did not consider themselves Nazis. Mm. If that makes sense, mm -hmm. they had the um, the. Uh, I didn't see the swastika too much. They had they had a swastika that was rounded, and I thought it was represented a galaxy. I thought it looked more like a galaxy arms than a swastika. I didn't know what it was at the time. But they, their main symbology was the eagle mm. that you always see that they, you know, it was an eagle. And then under the eagle was always a picture of Ceres or the ship or words, a, a German words that had something around it. Like there was always something different underneath the eagle, but the eagle was their symbology or the Nazi or a round, a rounded um, swastika was yeah. in there too. You know, the but original, they, they always had an eagle. The original swastika, well, I mean, where Hitler, I, I believe where he saw it, you know, the Hindu, the Hindu symboli symbology, iconography from thousands of years ago, bearing in mind they have five holy Bibles, you know, whereas the Christians and Catholics have the one. But the first time I was in Kauai at a Hindu monastery, it was being hand built, hand chiseled gently. And I saw this emblem. I'm like, oh, my God, it was a reversal of the evil swastika. And I thought that's where he got, that's where he saw, that's where he picked that sign for the Nazi, um, you know, hierarchical horror, but that's where he got it from, you know, ancient symbology. And a lot of people don't know that, you know, but what, what Hitler did, he reversed it. As, as we know, everything dark is inverted and the reverse hmm. of love. Um, so gosh, that's amazing, amazing. Hmm. Oh, the horses, now when they talk about horses, were there uh, horse symbologies there? Are they talking about actual animals? The no, they said that like during the, during the Thirty Years' War in the 1600s mm -hmm. in Europe, mm -hmm. they wrote they they said that you know their their thing was that the enemy had spaceships, and we had horses, right. and we won. Right. That or that that was like their motto. That I remember them proud. They always were proud of that. They, mm -hmm. And then on Ceres Colony, there were horse statues everywhere. They had horse likenesses. There was always like a horse on the wall. You know, like in the artwork they had they had battle scenes from the 30 year war for artwork and on the money they did have money even though not everybody used cash but they did have cash money and on some of it was battle scenes of guys and swords and horses going down into it with with cannons and stuff there were battle scenes oh my god wow. so i when i got to my post there i was working on a converted submarine a, a ship that was a submarine and uh turned into a spaceship Good. and it was old by the time I got it was already rusty and, and in bad shape when I got it, it was and it was uh, it had high mileage kind of thing and so it was always breaking down we were always working on it and um, I was on that thing for years I mean seven eight years was what I did are you in the ocean yeah, is love. there an ocean on series like what is the atmosphere no. like what are you looking no, no. at here? there's no atmosphere it's underground everything okay. was underground so they had found an existing uh, base there that some other species had built long ago, and they moved in and began converting it to human occupancy. They found mm -hmm. rooms that they turned into uh, caverns that had ro individual rooms in the in the side of the wall that they built scaffolding up and elevators to and made those apartments. They had big caverns that were cut out and then natural caverns that were full of water. They emptied the water out and they built cities in them. They had artificial gravity. They had um, their own. They had to lease generators, like free energy. But they there was a trade deal where they got generate. You know, they would earn a generator that would give free energy for the gravity plating. They had freight uh, gravity plating everywhere, miles and miles and miles and miles and miles of powered flooring that generated fake gra artificial gravity, and. Um, they had built a replica of, oh, sorry, I got to itch on my back here. <laughs> oh. They built a replica of a European city. I don't, I'm not sure exactly which one. I, I always want to say Copenhagen. That's the first thing that I feel, but it might not have been. But it was a replica of a European city in a cavern. And so that that way, when uh, ETs could come and visit, they could see what it was like on Earth, where they came from. And they told the general populace that the Earth had been destroyed. Of course. So the military people knew because we were going, we were flying back to Earth. We would fly to Diego Garcia and pick up cargo and drop off cargo. Mm -hmm. 
at Diego Garcia at night. We did it often. And we went to a place in um, South America in the Katarina Mountains. There's a cavern that we could go into and they were dropping off cargo to inner earth people that were based. And then we did go to Antarctica and drop off cargo and, and take cargo from there out to the Kuiper Belt. So very far out in the solar system, there are big giant um, bodies of ice that they went and hollowed out. And it's and so, some of them are not just all ice, but some of them were ice that they went in and, and made um, a base inside of it. And that's basically a story, basically just a warehouse, like a garage yeah. for them because um, space on series con inside series colony was actually very limited. And they were constantly building and the towns all the way around the inside of the, inside of the planetoid are connected by trains. There's a train network. What were the indigenous species on Ceres? What do they look like? Well, there were humans, mostly there, two, a couple hundred thousand people of humans, but there were two other ET species that lived among, that lived there. And they were a tall, uh, one was a tall, skinny race with a long, I guess, skull, straight hair. They had different color, blonde, red, black hair, just like us. They had all different color hair, but always straight, very, always long and straight hair. And they had a longer skull, they had bigger eyes, and their, their I'm going to use this arm, their elbow was like back here, like the distance from here, and then their forearm was longer than, uh, they had a different proportion mm. of their legs and their and their mm. arms, and they, they were about seven feet tall, and they lived there, and they did all, they did almost all technical work, like they worked on the ships, on discs, and on power systems. In the hangars, they worked in the hangar bay, pulling ships apart that's what they did so the, the the shortness of the elbow the longness of the part and the extra part of the limb is that because they could also go on all fours did you see them running on all fours no no, no they definitely did not go on all fours okay they and were the, they were people they were people people and the elongated skull um do they remind you of the kind of you know the upper egypt the the, the crown of upper egypt that kind of shape you know how we're told that Akhenaten and no and, uh... I, I i wasn't aware of any of that back okay. then you know like when i look back on it i just remember that their back of their head was pretty long it came mm -hmm. out and they had hair that came straight down it i thought it looked cool i thought they were i thought they were weird looking as because of the way they they walked in a weird lanky way the way they walked i thought was stupid you know like i didn't <laughs> I, I, I'm saying, you know, the kind of person I was then when I yeah. was there, the yeah. way they walked was kind of threw me off. I wasn't, I was uncomfortable with it. Right, right. But I thought they looked cool, mm -hmm. right? Like in the face, I thought they were cool looking and I was forbidden to interact with them. I was, because I had been mind controlled and mm -hmm. trauma based, I was forbidden to interact with ETs, mm -hmm. meant, you know, never to talk to them. And I, I wasn't, it wasn't like I ran around. I only had a couple years of being a cargo engineer when I got promoted mm -hmm. and I was put on a bigger ship. I only had a couple years where I had a paycheck and um, the ability to get a train ticket and go places and look around. Oh my God. So I only lived like that for the last couple. And it was for me, you got to understand where I went through after I'd, what I went through and everything. It was kind of a big deal. You know, like it was, it was a triumphant thing for where I, you get what I mean? Like to oh actually yes. attain some freedom. Oh my God. And uh, it was a big deal to me. So which that means was trust my last too, couple right? Years. Oh my God. Mm. It's just unbearable. It's just, um, it's so mind blowing. It's so incredibly mind blowing. And again, thank you so much for sharing so much. Um, um, Antarctica. What was the cargo coming from Antarctica to the ice station? What was that cargo? Well, a lot of the times I wasn't allowed to know. There were times when we took from, there was um, there was a time that we took from the Katarina Mountains. We took we took a form of missile that was highly advanced. It was like a nuclear missile, but it was small. I mean, four or five feet long. And they said that once it was fired, nothing could stop it. Mm. It could fly through the mountain. It could fly through a mountain. It could go through solid objects and then detonate where you want it to go. So they said once it was fired, it was unstoppable. Mm -hmm. And it was not um, uh, available to them. It was something that they didn't have access to. It was a super uh, advanced technology. So when we did take it, so I wasn't supposed to know what was in the crates, 
but because of these, the 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 actual the 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 command crew came down. They had us open the crate up because they wanted to look at it. You know what I mean? They just mm -hmm. wanted to see it, and they snuck a look, and we all stood there and kind of looked at it. And uh, but it, but most the other thing about when we went to Antarctica was that we got it. They were always we had to be ready for inspection because they called they referred it to it as high command, and um, so whenever we went there we had to clean everything and be at our post and like there was no slacking allowed. And because we, if we got inspected, they could be, the captain could be demoted, like they mm -hmm. could get in trouble. So they really, every time we had a mission to Antarctica, it was very unpleasant because we had to clean everything from top to bottom. There's a lot of extra work. Oh my goodness, unreal. Wow, bless your heart. So did you along the way ever make a friend or feel a connection to any being human or otherwise in all of those sure. years? I had plenty of friends. I had mm. lovers. I had girl girlfriends and I was madly in love when I went back. I think that that's actually a common denominator for people that get their memories back is that they're in love with somebody that they yes. don't want to forget. Yes. And when I went back, I did not want to leave because there, I was in love with somebody there. And I think that's kind of what lent help to me remembering. But I had plenty of friends. We got to the point where my coworkers, we got along. We had humor, you know. Um, it was bearable, and uh, even though it was like a military, like a rough military existence at the end, like mm -hmm. being in the army or something, um, it was bearable. And I got along with the people I worked with. We we cracked jokes. We 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 got through it, you know. Wow. So. Wow, absolutely mind blowing, mind blowing. What do you think overall, everything that you've actually witnessed and experienced and seen, and you've seen far, far, far reaching, far advanced beings, technology, et cetera, where we are now on this planet coming into 2022 at this, you know, this complete tipping point on this planet as she evolves and humans are being upgraded, up leveled or introduced to other thought forms. What do you think is the overall message from you well what, what you know what do you think what is it that you learned when i was young when i was young i wasn't very when like in the 70s when i was a young kid you know like before i was taken when i was six seven years old i thought that life uh seemed pretty lame that being born i would think why am i born now i i, I would think like that like why am i alive now what is this all about and i thought that it was going to be pretty lame and it turns out that all of us that are alive today are in like one of the most important times in history because we're pre-disclosure. We're going to get disclosure. We're already getting it. We're already, yeah. We are disclosing right yes. now. So they've had this a secret, the civilizations that are trading on our behalf secretly have been at it for a hundred years now, but we're going to get a disclosure. We're going to join a galactic community and uh, we are talking about it to get people ready for it right now. So in in our lifetime, we're going to see this. We're going to the future is going to happen. I had a guest on my show. He said the future is all going to happen at once. It's not going to be it's not going to be like we think it is. No, it's going to happen all at one time. That once there's a once there's a disclosure and we have an ET mm -hmm. show up, it's going to happen very fast. And that's the message: is that we're going to have to keep up. There's there's bliss in ignorance, and we're all ignorantly blissful right now mm -hmm. and a lot's going to change it's going to be for the better we're going to see the planet and everybody on it move to a better uh, existence yeah i think that that's what we're putting up with right now is who they're getting ready to um to do so mm -hmm. uh, you know without speculating a lot you know everybody knows what's mm -hmm. going on yeah. in the world we've all seen the world go completely completely change in the last couple of years right it's going to yeah, keep going. There's exactly. going to be more weirdness in a minute. I think there's good things on the horizon for us. Oh, that's so beautiful. For me, what I've been witnessing, especially in the last three weeks, um, is you know how like we grow up and you know those of us that haven't gone through what you've gone through but we're like oh we're comfortable around stories about the moon and anyway we know that you know people talk about Mars and sometimes Venus but rarely Jupiter and what I've witnessed in the kind of communities that are talking about disclosure and, and actually disclosing and people who are starting to question everything uh, Elena Danan and Michael Sala did a show on Jupiter the other day and people's minds got blown and what happened also was in their own psychology their own uh, uh, um you know psychosis some of them hit walls it was like too much it was just too 
much. And that's okay because this is a mind stretching, mind bending time that we're in. And, you know, people are only comfortable with certain things happening and they, they're very confident, they're very expert in their like, I've learned this and that, let's discuss the wars on Orion and all the rest of it, things I'd never heard of until Elena started talking about it, you know, uh, to be honest, which I'm being, which we should be honest, like, let's give you guys the credit for goodness sake, you know, even those of us who've had metaphysical and alien experiences and spiritual experiences, let's, you know, we're learning you guys are teachers, you, Alex, Elena, for example, in particular, I feel like in my community, it's mostly you three that I, that I, I you know, get my information from, um, not disregarding any of the others. Um, but, you know, it is an, an amazing time and we are being stretched. And so people have hit their comfort zone, they've hit their wall, and then they'll get over it in a couple of weeks, they'll be like, oh, yeah, Jupiter's no big deal. Hey, let's talk about Pluto. You know, and then, you know, I've met a couple of people recently in my sessions as a spiritual therapist, and I'm like, okay, I don't know how to break this to you, but actually, I really feel that you're not just connected to this solar system and had experiences in other planets as we know them in the solar system. I feel there's another bandwidth here that you are able to, and two of these people have gone, oh my God, I knew it. And then we've gone into that that discovery, gentle, gentle discovery, you know, which is what we're all we're all galactic. And the other thing I see is people like you, God, you're such a gift. Honestly, Tony, what a gift. We are, there is a merger happening with our beautiful planet and our brothers and our sisters on other bodies, sentient alive bodies, other planets. And people like you are bringing the stories together. It's going to be easier for us to connect to our galactics because of this disclosure. People even in the community are, what a, you gotta give me a second to find the words because you touched on some things that I wanna, I wanna remark on. I, I wanna say this, that my, my experience up there is different in the way that a lot of people that have spoken about, uh, that have come forward whistleblowers only go, so far, you know, I'm screwing up the words already, but what I want to say is that people are mistaken and greatly, we've been greatly influenced to believe that to go from here, number one, to go from here to Mars would take years, mm -hmm. right? Then, okay, then uh, in our fiction and our sci-fi to go from here to another plant, to another star would take years to another star. So if you were going to the other side of the galaxy, it's like even with the faster than light craft, it would take you, you know, 10, 20 years to get anywhere else in the galaxy. So there's no going to a different galaxy. So even people, when they're getting readings or whatever, like the spiritual community, they're like, everything's in our neighborhood. The, you know, your last life, you were a Pleiadian. Your last life, you were an Arcturus. You're getting these kind of things, but the reality is not that at all. The reality is that there's quite a bit going on around Jupiter, to be honest. There are bases, I'm, I've documented, I went on record in 2015 saying about trips to Jupiter. There's at least two bases there that I'm aware of that we visited on the ship and a natural portal that would allow the ship to go to other galaxies. Our ship could leave in the morning, go two or three stops throughout our galaxy, come back here, go to another galaxy, make two or three stops and come back home at the end of the work day, mm -hmm. every day. The universe is good. So when you're talking about where you incarnated from, it's not in our neighborhood. People have incarnated from a billion galaxies away in another yes. direction. Yes. And people, this is what science fiction tells us. They're all rocket ships, even Star Trek. They go way out there, but they can't go very far. They're stuck in the galaxy. It's not the truth. We have access to millions of other galaxies. Once they get to a level of technology and a major guard, major posts in for our galaxy, a major stop in our galaxy is in our solar system. We live in a busy part of the galaxy. Our solar system is a major, um, you know, an exit ramp for coming here from another galaxy. You're going to stop here. Mm -hmm. And we are so because of that, Earth has been a mix of genetics and a mix of different politics and everything. It's not like most planets are more typically kind of one or two cultures. The Earth has many, many different cultures because we're in a busy part of the galaxy of the universe in general. 
and the distance from here to somewhere else is very short for them, for people that are in these programs already. So we need to get our heads around this, Yes. that we're not getting contact from just of the grays yes. and just the reptiles. We're getting contact from billions and billions of different species, from billions and billions of different worlds all over the place. And it's like an every day, it's a day at the office. Mm -hmm. And it's a very busy through road in our solar system. Mm -hmm. Glad Thank you mentioned you, about Jupiter. People hit the wall on that stuff. Yes. And you got to think, you got to open your mind up to the fact that it's not just our area of space. It's not just our galaxy. Yeah. It's, yeah. And you know, you the know belief times systems, a trillion. Right. The belief systems are going to get shattered. You know, like I remember years ago when I was a kid, I was, on, I was seven years old and I'd learned all about Jesus and I was in church every week and blah, blah, blah. And then we're on a, on, a, on a bus and it's a biology class and there's a rainbow appeared in the sky. And the teacher said, can anybody tell me how that rainbow got here? And thank God I didn't speak up because I almost screamed out, Jesus, put it there. And the next thing, there's this whole scientific conversation going on about prism and light bending and reflection. And I'm like, my life shattered. My whole belief system shattered in that moment. And I thought, oh, wow. oh right? So that's where we're at. People are like, no, 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 no. We're, and it's okay, you know, it's, it, it doesn't need to be such a shattering shock as we're going into this disclosure and living in, you know, the truth of people like you. Um, it is okay to go, you know what? I don't know everything. Let me just have an open mind. Let me lead with love. Because like you said, you fell in love on this horrific trauma journey that you were trapped in this sense of loss of time and no time for so long. And they, they, that's what the nefarious ones always underestimate. They don't have the ability to connect to the frequency of love. They absolutely don't. People like Kathy O'Brien, who escaped the CIA mind control, it was because she was in love. She found love. You remember and retain some memories because you were in love. And that love vibration that every single religion on the world in the center of the religion is that connection to love. Yeah, there's so much shit in between in all of them as far as I'm concerned, but it's that love frequency. And yes, so let's love ourselves into listening to people like you, accepting that you know more than we do because you've experienced it. Take what feels right, throw away the rest, doesn't really matter because ultimately we're all moving in the same direction. And that is that complete connection to the fabric of this universe and this galaxy and others well that was well put i don't feel like i'm i know uh you know what i mean like a lot i just experienced that and i remember it it's based off my memories um, another thing is that not all ets are as advanced as us and not all people not all ets are as primitive as us and by when i say that i mean like mentally not technologically, but I mean, we're not, we, there, are, there are other higher planes of human being a human existence that exist up there that we are going to aspire. Your soul is going to get to. And a lot of people we've been lied to and told that we're the top of the food chain. We're God's greatest achievement. And that's not the case. It's not the case. There is, there's a higher, there's greater existence to aspire to. Uh, the, one thing that I think is a drawback is that people don't see what these other beings are like and what they can do. So nobody aspires to really grow. You know, and people, mm -hmm. people are aspiring to, to consume and to acquire. Mm -hmm. They're not aspiring to grow and, 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 and grow their minds mm -hmm. just for the purpose. A lot of people do, but most people don't. Most people yeah. are trying to accumulate um, status or, or items, yeah. you know, and uh, it's, a, it's a dead end. Yeah, it's, it's a total you know, dead end. Why? You know, boom, the earth has just blown up or we've been moved off it and then you're going to take all that shit with you. No, you're not. What you take mm -hmm. with you is your experiences and your abilities and your metaphysical ability and your, you know, spiritual attainment, soul attainment. It's just so, so beautiful. Well, my love, we have been on now for almost two hours and I know you need a glass of water and a light down and you've been interviewing all morning and you've got Thanks. Shasta, Mount Shasta coming up. They're going to be I got to get ready for my trip. Yeah. That's right. Tomorrow I'm going to get my, we'll start working on my slideshow and polish that up and get ready mm. for my presentation uh, next week. I'm looking forward to that. I would just want to plug my website. So I have a Patreon channel, Talks with Tony. It's Patreon slash Talks with Tony. I'll give you the link. And then you can get to there from TonyRodriggs.com is my website. I have, I book consultations for people that feel like they've been through the same thing. I have a memory course for people that have fragmented memories for whatever reason. I, it's just exercises that I developed when I got my memories back. Yeah. That's on there. I have links to the link to my Patreon show, show which has um, been great, doing good. 
and uh, free interviews. And then there's info on there from CIA declassified stuff from Girl Flame from those days uh, and then books on how the psychic phenomenon worked. There's a lot of stuff on that website. So check it out, TonyRodrigues.com and uh, have a look at my show. Beautiful, Tony, thank you so much. I will stop the record button, but just hold on for a second after. Uh, to the audience, thank you so much for watching and engaging. And I know that you're gonna be so moved um, by the story and testimony of this beautiful man from a little boy to an adult. So please do check out his body of work, his legacy, because Tony Rodriguez is already a legend. He is and has left a legacy of work for us to learn from and grow from. And uh, I know you all join me in saying, Tony Rodriguez, thank you so much. We love you and thank you so much. Thank you. That's very warm to hear. Thank you so much. Take care. All right. Bye, guys.